Today on Reparations in Action. It must be said that the entire system is built on uh, African uh, labor, African, the theft of African labor, uh, African ability to produce life. It's built against that. You're listening to Reparations in Action. Reparations now! Uhuru. You're listening to the Reparations in Action podcast and FM radio show, The White Lies Shattered series. My name is Jamie Simpson. White Lies Shattered is a program of reparations in action, exposing the insidious lies we tell ourselves as white or European people about the nature and origin of America and the current social system. On Reparations in Action, we believe reparations to African people is the key question of our times and is one that demands action on the part of European or white people. As always, we'd like to salute Black Power 96, where this show is aired and recorded for our podcast weekly. Today, we are discussing the lie that the academic ivory tower is a bastion of objective truth and justice. With us today is Penny Hess, the chair of the African People's Solidarity Committee and the author of the book, Overturning the Culture of Violence. And later in the show today, we have the honor of having a special guest, Dr. Matsumela Odom. Matsumela is a visiting assistant professor of ethnic studies at the University of San Diego and a black studies instructor at various other colleges and universities. He is also the vice president of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement and a member of the African People's Socialist Party. But we want to begin today by speaking with Chairwoman Penny Hess. Uhuru and welcome, Penny. Uhuru, Jamie. I'm really glad to be back on White Lies Shattered today, and I'm really looking forward to the interview with Dr. Odom. That is going to be profound. So today we are talking about U.S. colleges and universities, and universities, of course, portray themselves as the place where there can be the free investigation of ideas and the studies of various points of view in pursuit of, quote, objective truth and beauty and goodness and all of these things. And for example, Harvard University has the motto Veritas, which, in, which is Latin for truth. Yale University's motto is looks at Veritas, light and truth, etc. You know, we could go on. But today we're going to discuss the reality that U.S. U- universities, including and even maybe especially those universities of the ruling class, the top universities of the United States, quote unquote, are built on, funded, and fueled by wealth gained by owning, selling, and enslaving African human beings on land stolen from the indigenous people. It's not surprising um, that that happened because the entire capitalist economic and social system of the U.S., rests on a foundation of the enslavement, genocide, colonialism, and oppression of African indigenous people and and the domination of the majority of the people on the planet Earth, as Chairman O'Malley Ishitella and the theory of Ishitellaism or African internationalism informs us. So, but, you know, the question that, that we want to raise is that That being the case, can you separate the ideas pursued at the university separate from its financial interests and realities? And because the reality is that all ideas pervade by the university and society are ideas that emerge on a pedestal of colonialism and suffering of many for the leisure of a few, the colonizers, the white people, to pursue these these ideas, um, this is, you know, how can these things be separated? But before we start, as always, we want to salute Chairman Omali Ishitella, who is chairman of the African People's Socialist Party that formed the African People's Solidarity Committee that I am a part of, that I have the honor of being the chair of. 
And the African People's Socialist Party, which is working for the total liberation and unification of Africa and African people in Africa, but all around the world, wherever they have been forcibly dispersed through this assault on Africa and the enslavement of African people. Um, and the liberation of Africa, the land, the end of the borders, you know, as, as a um, continuation of the African liberation movement that has been going on for the past 600 years, African people fighting for their freedom and liberation. And um, that the African People's Socialist Party created the African People's Solidarity Committee as a white organization to go into the white community to win solidarity and reparations and unity with the right of African people to be free and liberated and have to the return of their stolen land, resources, and labor. And um, I think this is, you know, extremely important and really profound. I also salute Deputy Chair Ona Zene Shatella and all the members of the leadership and, and the rank and file members of the African People's Socialist Party all over the world who inspire us to do everything possible on our front, behind enemy lines, to, uh, to contribute to the future of humanity and, and the liberation of African and all oppressed peoples. So we're talking about universities and the fact that universities are not some pristine ivory tower that they rest on um, financial, tremendous uh, financial um, you know, basis and donations from the uh, benefactors of the uh, assault on Africa and the enslavement of African people. And one of the most famous of these universities that has been in the news quite a bit is Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., which was founded in 1789. And in 1838, Georgetown sold 272 enslaved African people as a fundraiser to keep the university going. And that sale, which included little children and babies, raised in today's dollars millions of dollars. And this has been brought to light recently and has been much talked about in the media. And in fact, according to the New York Times uh, about this uh, sale of African people to keep Georgetown University going, uh, the Times wrote, quote, the human cargo was loaded on ships at a bustling wharf in the nation's capital, destined for the plantations of the Deep South. Some slaves pleaded for rosaries as they were rounded up, praying for deliverance. But on this day, in the fall of 1838, no one was spared. Not the two-month-old baby and her mother, not the field hands, not the shoemaker, and not Cornelius Hawkins, who was about 13 years old when he was forced on board. At Georgetown, slavery and scholarship were inextricably linked. The college relied on Jesuit plantations in Maryland to help finance its operations, university officials say. Slaves were often donated by prosperous parishioners. And the 1838 sale, worth about $3.3 million in today's dollars, was organized by two of Georgetown's early presidents, both Jesuit priests. So wait, wait, wait. We're talking about not only the oldest, uni one of the oldest universities in the United States, we're talking about a university that is owned and led by the Jesuits, also known as the Catholic Society of Jesus, one of the most esteemed and, by the way, richest orders of priests in the Catholic Church. Um, and, you know, so let's let's talk about that because uh, uh, you know last week and and uh, our our last some of our last podcasts when we were talking about and going over the um, just the depth of the brutal and savage uh, genocide against the indigenous people carried out by not only um, the state and white people as a whole but also by the Catholic Church we were talking about the ex how um, the Catholic Church was given the uh, the assignment to to administer the so-called residential schools, which is a horrible euphemism of genocide against the indigenous people, which kidnapped 
uh, little African, little indigenous children. And this happened in Africa also, by the way, but this is, um, you know, recently come out in, in Canada where these, the bodies of little children have been found um, buried under the, or around what was called the residential schools, which was where the children were kidnapped away from their parents and forced into incredible brutality. Many, many, many were murdered, slaughtered, sexually abused, and traumatized for life. Um, part of the genocide of the indigenous people. And this is the Catholic Church that did the nuns and priests. And, you know, it just, uh, it just is so clear why we're reading that as more and more bodies of little children uh, from the indigenous people are being found all throughout these different sites in Canada that suddenly we're seeing, you know, Catholic churches being burned and, and just, you know, just an uprising for what the Catholic church has done. And the fact that the Catholic church played a huge role in dividing up the world to give to the U European powers uh, for genocide and enslavement and basically divided up Latin America, South America, the Caribbean, uh, so that a lot of the different countries and slave trading powers of imperialist Europe would not go to war with each other, but would be able to, everybody would have a little piece of this genocide. And then of course, African people were kidnapped and brought to these areas as well. So you know, this is the role of the Catholic Church. And I just want to add a little, little fact also that currently the sexual abuse um, fees um, being paid out by the Catholic Church right now are, are more than $4 billion. So this is a very uh, brutal colonial institution, and um, that has been clear in its institutions. And not only is... Um, is Georgetown University, where there are you know, enslaved Africans sold that were owned by the Jesuits at Georgetown in Washington, D.C., but also in St. Louis, here where, where I am, in the city where I am, there is St. Louis University, also a Jesuit university. And um, from reading on a website about this, it's saying that the Society of Jesus, which is the Jesuits, whose involvement in the institution of slavery can be traced back to the colonial era. And when they're, when they're saying that, they're talking about the 13, quote, original colonies um, and expanded into Missouri in 1823. And they brought with them six enslaved men and women, Thomas and Mary Brown, Moses and Nancy Queen, Isaac and Susan Queen Hawkins. And from there, the number of enslaved Africans rose as new slaves were born and others were, quote, purchased. By 1831, there were at least 26 individuals held in bondage by the Jesuits in St. Louis. In 1829, the Jesuits had begun operating St. Louis University. They transferred several enslaved people from the Stanislaus Novitiate in Florissant, where the majority were forced to work to St. Louis, where they did laundry, cleaned, farmed, and drove wagons. Brown University, also um, in Providence, Rhode Island, is another case, a famous case, where that is funded by captains of what's called slave ships, the, the ships that went to Africa and captured African people and sold them. Um, and it, Brown University is funded by slave ship captains John Brown and James DeWolf. And James DeWolf was said to be the richest man in America at that time. And it goes deep. And you can read all about this reality of these universities and these people who funded it. The same is true with Harvard, Yale, and of course, um, the universities throughout the South. Uh, and many others, many others, and it you know continues to today. And I think that it's really, um, it's really important that we understand it from the point of view of what Chairman O'Malley Shatella calls colonialism as a means of production. That it was 
this enslavement of African people, it's not just about one institution or universities or even the church. It's about every facet of life for white people. Um, that African people were forced to labor, were raped, and and and, and their children were st stolen as commodities in order to provide wealth, prosperity, social wealth, um, you know, just a democracy for, for white people who are the colonizers on this land. And as Chairman O'Malley Chatella writes in his book, Vanguard, the advanced detachment of the African revolution, the chairman says, he says, the entire world is now locked into a single dialectical process a unity of opposites, whereupon the gruesome extraction of life and resources from Africa and the rest of the world is the condition for the life and, quote, development of what we now know as Europe, white people and the capitalist system to which we have been, meaning African people, have been forcibly affixed. The chairman says the legal system, culture, white sense of sameness, and political institutions, and I would add educational institutions, are reflections of this parasitic economic base. Every white aspiration and dream, every expectation for happiness and a good life from a successful marriage to a secure future for their children requires drone strikes in Pakistan, police murders, and mass imprisonment in the African colonies and barrios of the U.S., and starvation and forced displacement of the oppressed throughout the world. So this is, you know, why we say that, you know, the universities are just another front of institutions on the superstructure, sitting on the pedestal of the oppression of African indigenous people that owe reparations. They're part of owing reparations to African people as a way of returning the stolen resources and also um, to, to show that, again, every aspect of life for white people, there is no place that is pristine, that is untouched by this reality from the university, the halls of ivy to the, uh, you know, to the ivory tower, all of it. This all sits on the pedestal of slavery, genocide, murder, terror, rape, and pillage. Wow. It's continually mind-expanding to come to terms with this reality. And, and just like you're saying, Chairwoman Penny, that there's, there's no part of our society as, as a white colonial society that's, that's innocent or untouched as you said, and, and that goes uh, just as much, if, if not more so, for um, the, the halls of intellect, the pursuit of intellectual truth, mm -hmm. right, or objective truth. And uh, I, we don't have to even dig that far to see the role that slavery and genocide played in the creation of, of the universities and the college and colleges and, and the role that slavery itself and, and uh, oppressed African people played in creating even the, the existence of public education at all, which, which in, in large part happened after Reconstruction. And we're, we're going to talk to, to Dr. Matsumela Odom about that in a little bit here. But, you, you know, another thing that I was thinking about was just how hypocritical it is that the, these institutions claim that they're about objective truth and beauty when we, we know it, it's continually brought to the headlines the money that comes into these institutions from the imperial war sector, from the Pentagon, from the CIA. I know uh, some decade or more ago it came out about the University of South Florida uh, here in Tampa and St. Petersburg. Uh, getting Professors were getting millions of dollars to develop uh, the science of torture that then came out about Abu Ghraib and other uh, CIA-run prisons throughout the world, that you, you can't have objectivity and truth while at the same time having to please imperialism, which, which is funding that supposed pursuit. That's right. And, you know, I think that it, it's really important and just very um, 
maybe irony of history, but a very important thing that Chairman O'Malley Shatella was asked to speak at a debate at Oxford University in England. And this is probably the key top uh, university of um, imperialism, you know, of white power in the world that trains uh, people to, to be able to administer imperialism for them. And that uh, it's also the, the university that has the Rhodes Scholarship. So it was endowed by Cecil Rhodes based on the just unspeakable, you know, capture of African people in, in all throughout Southern Africa and enslaving them on their own land in the colonial process of, of British colonialism that just worked African people to death. Uh, and Cecil Rhodes was also one of the wealthiest men, perhaps the wealthiest man in the world when he died. And he had um, diamond mines and everything uh, that are still owned by the colonial powers, not owned by and benefiting African workers on the continent of Africa. African people on the continent are still the most impoverished people on the planet, the majority of whom are struggling to live on a dollar twenty-five a day. So yeah, this is there's there's no there can be no separation between that and between what um, the university represents. That we can have no I you know just sort of self that's that's a lie that we tell ourselves that you know going to the university and these ideals of truth. But Chairman O'Malley Chatella brought that truth home and won that debate, trounced the other side, and the students had to give him a standing ovation. And anybody listening can can watch that incredible debate by Chairman O'Malley Chatella by going to um, the Oxford Union's website or YouTube channel and um, typing in O'Malley Chatella and watch his incredible, incredible electrifying presentation at Oxford University. Yeah, it, I, I second that. That's definitely something that you you will um, really, really see the benefits of checking that out. And um, it, it's a, an incredible moment of speaking truth to power. You can just see the electricity in the room. Um, it makes what you're saying. Penny makes me um, remember what uh, Chairman Amalia Shatella has said before in his books and presentations that colonialism, you know, it's not like a philosophy. It's, it's not a policy. It's not a way of thinking. It is a mode of production. Yes. And it's something that we talk about a lot and we have to talk about a lot more because the, the fact that it is a mode of production, that, that means human lives. Like the chairman said, it means that there are millions upon millions of African people whose, whose talents, whose genius were never able to be, uh, you know, given to the world, to society. And that um, those incredible talents of African people who, you know, have been given, have been stolen so that the people who made money from it were white people, generally speaking. And but it forwards this capitalist economy. So, you know, when we look at all the problems that have to be solved and the all of the science, all of the art, um, everything that, that has to be put together from the genius of humanity to solve the problems that this world is facing right now due to this system of, of capitalism, which has really already created the extinction of millions and millions and millions of, of indigenous people and, and African people, that it's not going to be white people that can ever come to the conclusions on how to solve the problems and implement a new world in the future. That is going to be African people, indigenous people, and oppressed and colonized people around the world. And I, I stand in tremendous total unity in solidarity with that future, and I hope you will too. You're listening to Reparations in Action. Reparations now! I mean, this is what colonialism does. It's a filthy, nasty kind of process where you have a situation where one group, 
a society lives at the expense of another group. And as we know, when you talk about society, you're talking about something that's comprised of an economic base, an economic base, and a superstructure. An economic base is how that society secures what it needs to, to live, exist, what it, what it takes to have food, clothing, and shelter. And the superstructure is something that responds to that economic base. All of the institutions, the legal institutions, the culture, the ideology of that society springs from the kind of economic base it has. So if you have an economic base that comes from slavery and colonialism, then the ideas that exist in that society, the institutions, the legal institutions, etc., respond to that reality. That was the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party, Omali Eshetela, speaking at a day of reparations to African people speaking tour event in 2017. And now we want to move to a very important conversation I had the honor of having with Dr. Matsamela Odom, who is a visiting professor in ethnic studies at the University of San Diego. He is a black studies instructor at various other colleges and universities in the San Diego, California area. He is also a very prominent member of the African People's Socialist Party and the vice president of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement. I first asked Dr. Matsumela Odom to uh, speak to us about the role that the profits from the slave trade in African people played in the founding of universities and colleges in North America, as well as the role of uh, colonial genocide and colonial oppression of African and indigenous people in these institutions of so-called education? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting uh, question or conversation. Uh, as you know, I'm the co-host of the People's War radio show or podcast. Um, that's out of uh, Black Power 96 in St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, we just had a, a episode on the residential schools, these uh, four sporting schools that indigenous people in Canada were uh, placed in um, as a form of, uh, you know, colonial domination and theft of culture, labor, land, stuff like that. So uh, it's, it's, it's important to note that, you know, colleges, universities, but schools overall, you know, education overall uh, was um, essential to the uh, project of the development of colonial capitalism, namely the theft of indigenous land and the theft of uh, African labor um, so uh, when we look at the earliest of uh, schools, right, the earliest of colleges in uh, West North America, you know, we could think about uh, the Catholic universities, especially the ones on the West Coast, all descending from direct relationship to the mission system uh, as well, uh, you know, in some instances, either the Franciscan run mission system or the Jesuit run mission system. So, 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 so that is, uh, that, that, that lays that there. Um, uh, and then, you know, when you come to, I think it's schools like Dartmouth, uh, William and Mary that also have their uh, origins in, uh, being schools that, uh, were, were created to, uh, uh, you know, uh, a turn, um, to, 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 to erase the culture. Uh, of uh, indigenous people uh, and stuff like that. So, I mean, that, that seems to be a necessary uh, uh, precedent for us talking about the colonial enslavement of African people uh, because, you know, as we talked about, you know, part of that uh, theft of life and labor uh, uh, is, is, is important. But, uh, and, and so, 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 so that's important, right? It's important to note that uh, the public university system in the United States, namely with the origins of places like the University of, of Virginia system uh, created by Thomas Jefferson, 
uh, was directly linked to the plantation economy that they had taking place uh, over there in, um, you know, in the colonial South, but all throughout uh, the colonial system. You know, we know that in the what's you know the colonial North, something like Boston, not Boston, but Brown University uh, was. Um, directly linked to the slave trade and the profits from the slave trade, uh, the shipping industry and stuff like that. Harvard University Law School, uh, the actual seal on the Harvard uh, University Law School was, it it was the same seal of a plantation uh, over in uh, Barbuda, uh, Antigua and Barbuda. Um, uh, And and it's the uh, profits from uh, that uh, slave in uh, you know enterprise of colonial enslavement of African people uh, that created the funds to create the very first endowed chair of Harvard. So I mean it, it, it's really deeply, deeply embedded uh, into it in terms of the production of capital, but also uh, you know Chairman Omar Ashitella in stolen black labor. Um, uh, the political economy of domestic colonialism produced almost 40 years ago, you know, gets into uh, a guy by the name of Eli Whitney. Uh, and uh, Eli Whitney, we all know, created the cotton gin. But one of the things that uh, Eli Whitney, uh, the, the, one of the things that Chairman talks about in terms of Eli Whitney in, in that essay, uh, in, in that part is, he talks about the fact that, you know, the entire uh, university system, you know, Yale University, I think is what Eli Whitney was associated with, was 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 able to exist because of the knowledge uh, being produced by, um, by 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 enslaved African labor uh, and stuff like that. So um, so you have that, you know, the, the actual uh, slave uh, actual university that owned Africans. Uh, operated on the bodies of Africans after the, you know, um, uh, turned African women's wombs into uh, testing grounds for uh, a medical technology. Uh, Africans who die and became uh, on the and became the cadavers for the research, uh, you know, um, and, and and all sorts of a uh, 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 different uh, variety of ways through which. Uh, you know, the formations of the universities and colleges in uh, North America are directly linked to the colonial enslavement of African people. I then asked Dr. Matsumela to speak to the role that the resistance of African people to their own oppression uh, played in the founding not only of public universities, but of uh, public education institutions overall in the United States. Correct. Yeah, I mean, it's it's correct. Yeah, the the entire idea of public education, uh, really, even after, uh, uh, I want to say after the time of the uh, U.S., uh, you know, colonial revolutionary war, um, but, you know, uh, in the 1780s, I want to say it was in the early 1780s, there was something called the, the Free African School or African Free School, Free African School in Philadelphia. Uh, becoming um, uh, 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 a site of a free public education. Uh, but yeah, without a doubt, uh, following a Reconstruction, uh, or following the, the U.S. Civil War, there was uh, the very first public education system, you know, the idea of public of education as a human right for people uh, began with the uh, you know, the, the demands for self-determination and uh, uh, dual powers of sorts uh, within the African community. Um, my numbers aren't absolutely correct, but I know there's something to the extent of that. The U.S. government had uh, put forth something like $250,000 to build schools uh, in the South during the Reconstruction period, but Africans themselves, uh, you know, fresh out of slavery, had raised over a million dollars to build their own schools, right? Um, uh, so, so yeah, but we also know that 
the overturning of that system uh, was was crucial in the um, maintenance of colonial capitalism, uh, the um, unification of white workers with uh, white bosses uh, against uh, African, the African working class and stuff like that, in which uh, white workers had proven the willingness to not go to school, to not go to hospitals and things like that if uh, they had to share space with Africans. I then asked Dr. Matsumela Odom to talk to us about the colonial assumption of superior education that we have in, in uh, white society or European society, that we, we often think of ourselves as bringing education to African people, and uh, to speak to us about the role that uh, the theft of culture from Africa played in white people's ability to colonize African people in the first place. Right, right. I mean, you know, uh, too often people think of, you know, the colonial enslavement of Africans as a snatch and grab. Uh, But, you know, there was a science behind the colonial enslavement of African people. That's why we can't separate, you know, the Enlightenment period uh, from, you know, what people call the Enlightenment is uh, begins at the moment of the colonial enslavement of African people and ends actually at the moment of, you know, the uprising of African people against colonial enslavement in the 19th century. I mean, that's the period they call the Enlightenment. So <clears throat> what this lets us know is that, you know, what we what is understood as knowledge or enlightenment in uh, European society is only being produced by way of the uh, theft, uh, the colonization, the genocide of African people, the theft of African labor, the theft of uh, indigenous people's land, right? This is producing uh, the enlightenment. This is producing the ideas of science and all this other stuff that, uh, you know, white North American and European society uh, uses to uh, Tout itself as civilized or something like that. I then was able to speak to Dr. Matsumela about this current demand that we're seeing uh, for reparations to be paid by universities and colleges throughout the United States. Well, first off and foremost, it a lot. It, it must be said that the entire system is built on uh, African uh, labor, African the theft of African labor. Uh, African ability to produce life is built against that and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, so so it's not even just about whether a school owns slaves or owns some slave ships or something like that. But it's um, so so what it means is that you know all of the products, everything that these universities produce, uh, are owed to Africa and African people. Um, uh, and, uh, as much as possible, you know, uh, you know, uh, people, African people, people who are in line with the struggle for African liberation, uh, need to be, uh, fighting for, uh, you know, the, the return of those resources and those resources are material resources, human resources, their intellectual property, uh, uh, and, and labor and stuff like that. I then uh, asked Dr. Dr. Odom to speak to us about his experience in what I mistakenly characterized as the heart of bourgeois academia, or rather his, his experience teaching in universities and colleges as both an African man and as a revolutionary who is an African internationalist. Yeah, who... Um, I think that's interesting because, I mean, I wouldn't even classify myself as in the heart of bourgeois academia because of all the things that you talked about, right? You know, um, I'm fairly well published. Uh, if you looked at my CV, you'd see a lot of publications. You see an extensive teaching career uh, and stuff like that, fairly good reviews. Um, uh, so, and and my time to degree was pretty good uh, in my doctoral program. But but uh, I, you know, I've made uh, conscious uh, political decisions uh, as an African internationalist 
uh, and, 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 and I think that that informs, uh, you know, the choices I make, but also informs the uh, way in which I interact with the system of, of higher education. Uh, what I will say about that is that uh, as an African internationalist, me entering into this space, I understand that this is a form of labor uh, and um, production, uh, you know, and that regardless of how good of a, you know, how much I love my students or whatever that are in my class or how much I enjoy the topics that I teach, that uh, the nature of the university is for me to produce uh, life and labor uh, for uh, the colonial system. And uh, I have to, um, you know, find uh, ways through which I uh, mitigate that by returning the resources and the skills that I've learned in this entire system uh, to the people which is why the work that I do with the, the Burning Spear, the Co Department of Cadre Development, uh, as well as uh, the International People's Democratic Horror Movement is so vital because some of these skills of, you know, reading, writing, public speaking, things like that, uh, are uh, skills that, uh, you know, can be placed towards the development of a party, a vanguard party of professional revolutionaries. And stuff like that, but I think also an understanding uh, that uh, this is indeed a, a a system of labor that I'm involved in. Uh, you know, to just like I said, just to understand the fact that uh, you know we need institutions of dual and contending power, uh, but also um, you know with my classrooms, what I do is 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 is, is I. Um, uh, create a, a form of, you know, a, a cont uh, c c contending. I, I, I try to contend with the dominant narratives. I try to contend with the colonial narratives and sources uh, that most people use by uh, introducing uh, literature by Chairman Omali Eshetela and the class coming up that I'm teaching in the fall. I'm going to use the co Overturn the Culture of Violence by uh, Penny Hess. And, um, and and really just uh, introducing the idea, uh, introducing African internationalism into my curriculum uh, for students. Uh, you know, and I do that a variety of different ways. I've got one class on political participation in which uh, I have students learn really the material basis to reparations, uh, a history of African uh, organizing in the U.S. Uh, uh, I bring important uh, African internationalist interventions into the study of the African liberation movement, such as, uh, you know, Garveyism versus uh, Garveyism versus Du Bois and Du Bois and, and Pan-Africanism, you know, African internationalism versus Pan-Africanism, uh, uh, things like that. But I, so I have all my students do all these readings uh, and stuff like that. But then at the end of the semester, they put together a, um, a, a program in which they they will uh, learn how to they, they put together a plan of action a POA they learn how to build a POA and then uh, after their POA their POA is around a reparations campaign right so, so 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 they try to bring they have to bring their skills their interests to the development of a reparations campaign and a reparations organization that they like to build. And we go over the different ways to have organizations. Is it going to be a coalition? Is it going to be a, a revolutionary party? Is it going to be a mass organization underneath, underneath the leadership of a revolutionary party? Is it going to be an organization made up of white North Americans? You know, things like that, you know. And uh, we, we look at speeches from the chairman. We look at speeches from... Uh, Chairwoman Penny Hess and, and and all that stuff, you know. So I just try to bring these ideas into 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 the classroom. I asked Dr. Matsumella to specify w in which classes he is teaching and uh, giving this profound education in African internationalism. Yeah, so I teach a couple different classes. First is uh, basically a Black History class uh, in two parts. Uh, one which begins in Africa and then comes up to the time of 
of the Civil War and Reconstruction. Then the other one uh, begins with Civil War and Reconstruction and comes to the present. Uh, so that's basically a variety of different terms, but uh, you know, some people might call it African American history. I know that that's not the term we would use, but that's you know the term on the books. Um, uh, there's another class called Black Political Participation in America. That's that one that we look at. Uh, there's also Introduction to Black Studies or Introduction to Africana Studies. That's the one in which uh, you know I use Omali Yeshitela speaks and introduce uh, the African internationalism uh, as a uh, uh, as the overarching theme uh, for the class, and uh, we. Uh, and investigate a variety of different uh, research methods uh, in the class uh, as African internationalists. Finally, I asked Dr. Matsumela Odom to tell us whether he has received any uh, pushback or repression of his revolutionary teachings from the university. Uh, not really. I mean, I'm pretty sure I, I didn't get a couple of jobs that I that I had applied for because of my political my political affiliation, but but not within. The departments, the departments that I teach in, are fairly uh, sympathetic, at least to the movement. Uh, they have uh, brought Chairman out to speak, Chairman Amalia Shatella out to speak many times. Uh, you know, uh, my my advisor at one college, at San Diego Mesa College, uh, about eight years ago or so, had Chairman Amalia Shatella speak in her class. So, you know, teaching, uh, when I teach generally in Africana studies departments or ethnic studies departments, I don't have too much of a, uh, of a, of a, of a pushback there, but, but so, so within my departments, um, not necessarily, uh, uh, but, but, but undoubtedly, uh, you know, there are a larger, um, there is a larger, uh, 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 but, and well, the one thing I would say is that um, this is only because of the the, the training uh, as an African internationalist uh, on how to uh, take the party in whatever areas and arenas we go. Right, we're taught to to be the party. So if that's um, you know in an academic space, you know uh, I learn you know trying to learn how to bring the party with me and African internationalism with me uh, as much as possible. However, um, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, however, it's it's undoubtedly, of course, should be noted that, uh, you know, um, last year, uh, Chairman Oli Shatella had experienced slander from uh, people in the uh, academic community here uh, in San Diego and stuff like that. So, um, but uh, not from any other people in my department. We want to extend our uh, profound appreciation to Dr. Matsumela Odom, visiting professor of ethnic studies at the University of San Diego and the vice president of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement for joining us today on Reparations in Action, the White Lies Shattered series, and helping us to destroy the lie that The Academic Ivory Tower is a bastion of truth and justice. You're listening to Reparations in Action. Reparations now! This has been an episode of Reparations in Action, the White Lies Shattered series, a biased podcast of white solidarity with black power. My name is Jamie Simpson. This episode was engineered by Marcel Marius, who also composed our theme music. The show is researched and produced by Penny Hess, Jesse Neville, and Lisa Watson from the Black Power 96.3 FM studio in St. Petersburg, Florida. A shout out to Akile Anayi and DJ Eddie Maltzby, as well as the entire Reparations in Action team, Sandra Forrest, Johan Bedingfield, Amanda Carlozzi, Kyle Weiss, Marissa Ricchetti, Ali Aiello, Alana Woods, Declan Keller, Hallie Murray, and Sarah Ritterspock. If you liked what you heard today, you can go to Apple Podcasts and rate this podcast. If you have questions, comments, suggestions, please email them to us at ria at blackpower96.org. Special thanks 
to the African People's Socialist Party's chairman Omali Yeshitela, without whose leadership and theory of African internationalism, none of the understandings presented on reparations in action would be possible. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week.